We welcome back uh, Quincy City Councilor, Councilor at Large, Nina Liang, for an update on the last two City Council meetings. Hi, Nina. Hi, Joe. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for checking in with us. Um, apologize for not having time last week, but uh, we'll get a twofer in today. Absolutely. How's things going uh, with the council? It's a busy, busy month this month, right? It always is. <laughs> Definitely. You know, we don't we don't stop for sure. You know, pre post election, um, it doesn't stop. We still have to make sure that we're continuing our work. And we've only got a couple meetings left before the end of the year, which is also the end of um, the 2019 to 2021 council term. So got a lot to do before we go into the new term. Right. Um, yeah, I should start off with the saying congratulations on your uh, re-election, a very strong showing on election night. Yeah, thanks. Um, and does that now mean that we can talk about the next council president? Uh, so, I mean, we'll, we'll see, right? Um, definitely going to happen during the first uh, sort of official council meeting in January, but that is uh, also the same day. I, I imagine that we're going to be doing the swearing in. And so, yeah, tune in. Okay. <laughs> You're not going to show your cards as to who you might nominate? <laughs> well, so, I mean, again, this is something where it's an internal decision, yeah. right? Um, for those who don't know, you know, who becomes the next council president is really a vote of the body. And so collectively, you know, we want to make sure that we're having conversations with one another because whoever the next council president is, um, you know, regardless of, of who the council president is actually, you know, the job is really to make sure that we're moving things forward on the agenda and that we are being inclusive of what all of us, you know, collectively as a body want to make sure we're discussing as well. Right. And so we want to make sure that whoever that person is, um, these are the same conversations that were being had when I was, you know, interested in doing this as well is that, you know, we can all sort of be on the same page with that, uh, you know, intention moving forward. Okay, so let me ask you this. What would your advice be to the next council president? Oh, that's a great question, Joe. Um, I think it would be to listen um, above all else, right? Again, you're you're managing, you know, eight, I think, very different personalities um, with eight different or sometimes the lines, but, you know, agenda items, right, that we want to discuss. And, you know, um, we have six ward counselors, and so their initiatives, their goals generally are always going to be focused on their wards, but they also look at citywide issues as well, because it does, when it's citywide, it's inclusive of their ward, right? And it, it impacts them as well. And so it's just being mindful and being intentional about, um, you know, proactively listening to, to what those ward counselors would like to see happen. And then for the at-large counselors as well, you know, we are also tuned into what happens to each ward and what happens in each ward and just making sure that, you know, again, whatever comes on to the agenda items, um, that we have for discussions per meeting that we're, you know, trying to put our best foot forward to represent our residents. And the best way to do that as council president is to listen, right, to your colleagues um, and to the priorities that they're bringing to the table. Yeah. Do you think um, being president has given you a different perspective on the way city government works as opposed to uh, as opposed to being a councilor at large? Mm, yes and no. I think yes, because the council president does set the agenda, you know, and so uh, sort of being on that side of the conversation is certainly interesting. But, you know, it, all of our votes count for the same. Um, and as a body, you know, with the nine of us in total, I think that and then for me, especially, right, I, I now I'm finishing up my third term um, and I've worked with, you know, all of my colleagues now for some time, um, Councilor Andronico being the newest, but even then he was on school committee before. And so you know, I've, I've always been the type where I try to be um, as collaborative as possible, you know, and I've really taken that same approach um, in my term as council president as well. And so it's certainly heightened, I think, but I don't think it's any different than what my style has always been up until this point. Okay. Um, going forward, uh, back to not being council president, do you have anything that was kind of on the, on the back burner that you couldn't get to that now you'll be able to? Yes. Again, dock on a bone with this residential property tax exemption. So, and I wouldn't say that it, was, it wasn't that I couldn't focus on it because of the council presidency, I think it was more so, you know, the pandemic, to be frank, right? I mean, we we all had, um, you know, goals and objectives that we we had coming into 2019, the beginning of 2019, you know, the, the, the beginning of this two-year term. Um, and we all had to, you know, sort of shift focus and say, okay, what are we doing now, right? And and so, I'm sorry, not beginning of 2019, beginning of 2020. Yeah. Um, yeah. In January 2020, right? Again, we all came into it with this, you know, grand plan of what we each wanted to happen. And, you know, a short 60, you know, 90 days later, we all had to shift, right? We we had to collectively come together and figure out what are we doing and what are our responsibilities as a city, as a city council um, to be supportive and responsive when the entire world shut down, right? Um, but on top of that, 
what do we need to do in response to our residents, business owners, right? People who we represent, what their concerns are. And so, you know, the focus was making sure that people were getting information as quickly as they needed to, right? We needed to work closely with the health department to figure out what are we doing with the businesses in the area? Are they opening? Are they shutting down? What are, what are the kids doing with the schools, right? What about funding for all of this? What are our first responders doing? What are the needs? I mean, there was so much that we had to do, you know, just under 90 days into, into our work last year, right? And so definitely getting back to that now that I feel like there's a little bit more of um, some stability with what we feel like we know is going on with the pandemic. It's certainly still there. There's still cases that are happening. Um, but I, I think there's definitely a lot more known factors now that we're going into um, in 2022 than there were in 2020 when we had to just be reactive um, and try to be as helpful as possible with everything going on. Yeah. So how would the residential tax exemption work, Nina? That's the question, right? That's that's the big question is where's the silver bullet in all of this and, and yeah. trying to make it work um, for everyone, right? And, you know, there are, um, the assessor's office has been amazing with putting some exemptions in place already. There's programs for veterans, programs mm-hmm. for seniors, um, and they work really hard to make sure that not only are those programs, you know, continuing to, to benefit residents in the city, but they're working really hard to also make sure that folks know about this benefit. And so there are already systems in place that the assessor's office is working on to provide exemptions for residents who live in Quincy. Um, this is an effort that I want to try to expand to all residents who live in the home that they own here in the city, right? And so the big question really, and I think the big um, sort of you know, issue that we've been facing up until this point is that if we provide this exemption for all homeowners who live in their home, you know, that's a significant decrease in tax dollars that we then have to spend on things like the health department resources, right? Our first responders, um, fixing the streets, right? Making sure that, you know, the HVAC system in our schools are great for those who are all back in school. And so, I mean, it's all cyclical. Um, and again, we need to make sure that we are finding a way to balance that offset. Um, and, in some way that's going to be significant, right? We, we don't have, again, that huge commercial tax base that other cities who take advantage of this have, right? We, we are majority um, residentially paid, you know, as far as um, our tax dollars go, right? Like 85% of our tax base, it comes from residents, right? And so if we provide an exemption off of that, where are we making up that money, you know? And that's where we need to get creative because you can't just pull money out of thin air, right? You can't just mess with the tax rate Right. There's 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 a whole system behind this. It, it's not just made up right from any of us. Um, there is a system in place that comes down from the state that we do have to follow. There there are regulations, there are guidelines to how we set that tax rate and how we set, you know, how much each uh, person needs to pay on taxes. And so we can't just shift those numbers wherever we want them to. You know, we need to fall within those parameters and guidelines and find a way to make it work. And so, again, you know, Colleen, John, quite a number of people in the assessor's office. Um, have been incredible the past few years and just walking me through all of that, you know, constantly providing updates on things that are happening, um, you know, how the values in the cities have changed. And so, you know, we're continuing to look at it. This isn't something that we stopped doing during the pandemic. You know, we, we still, uh, their office in particular has been great with making sure that they're still providing up-to-date information. Um, it's just a matter of finding a way to make it work. So we're going to get creative. We're going to have to get creative, but I'm sure there is an answer that someone or some groups of people have out there. We just need to work together to figure out what that is. Okay. All right. Stay tuned and watch watch closely for that one. Um, in terms of uh, coming back uh, to in person meetings, will that be up to the the next council president, or how, how do you? That's correct. That? Yeah. So the council president will determine um, if they're going to be in person, if they're going to be virtual. You know, some hybrid of of both. Uh, right. You know, we'll see what happens. But you know, we're obviously, as you know, working closely with all of you at QA TV right. with whatever decision that is, because you know, I think that. Um, the only reason it's worked up until this point is because we had the partnership with QATV. And so moving forward, even if we are back in person, I think we need to, you know, be inclusive about things that have worked during the pandemic and see how we can incorporate that into being in person. But ultimately that's up to whoever the next council president is going to be. Okay. Very good. Uh, so can we make it for lost time and talk about, uh, last week's council meeting first and some of the highlights there, if you could. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we did have a few things on the agenda last week, more so than we did this week, um, you know, last night. Um, The first was an appropriation to the Parks Department for Furnaceburg Golf Course. And so for those who don't know, uh, you know, the the lease is up on on Furnaceburg. And so in the past, what we had been doing is paying um, for the taxes on the property. It is it is city owned, right? Like it's it's our golf course. And so um, what we have to do now is make sure that when we do take it over, of course, we need to pay for the upkeep and the maintenance of it, right? And that is going to be incorporated into the Natural Resources Department. So, you know, technically under the Parks Department, but it's all under Natural Resources. And so this is something that was discussed during 
the budget earlier this past year and how that is included in here. So the 401,000, what it is, it's, it's an appropriation to cover the cost and the operation of the golf course. However, the income and the revenues that we get from the operation of the golf course will essentially, you know, wash the appropriation for the 400,000 that we had appropriated last week, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. Okay. And that was approved. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. I know the mayor um, told me he's going to be coming to the council at some point in the future. Um, looking for some major capital um, uh, funding to bring that place really up to date for today's golf standards, if you will. Yeah, I mean, not like anything else, the mayor cares very deeply for, you know, all of the public parcels that we have here in the city, the public buildings we have here in the city, the infrastructure we have in the city. I think that um, it's a very tangible um, thing that you can point to when you see all of construction, and all the work across the city that he wants to make sure that, you know, we're, we're not only maintaining, but improving you know, these types of structures that, you know, reflect upon the city, right? Um, and so the golf course is no exception to that. You know, that's, I think, a different conversation for me personally. You know, we, you know, saw this appropriation come in last week, you know, with the understanding, to me anyways, that the revenues would help to offset that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as far as requests for funding for capital improvements, that's, that's a different request, right? We're now asking to approve funding um, to improve the facilities, right, and, and improve the site. And, you know, we don't know the hard number to that yet. We don't know the timeline for how long that's going to take, right? And what impact that has on then the operation of the golf course, which we depend on the revenue for, right? And so there's a lot of, I think, implications for me that I would want to um, find out about before moving forward with any decision on that. But, you know, like any other financial request that comes before the body, we always make sure that, you know, it's particularly if it goes into committee, we engage the public on those conversations uh, before we move forward with any decision. Sure. Okay. Very good. Stay tuned for that. How about uh, last night's meeting? Uh, yeah. So last night uh, we had um, we had a big conversation in committee, uh, Chairwoman Mahoney Chair's Ordinance Committee. So we had a conversation in committee about um, another request that you know impacts short-term rentals across the city. We've been talking about this for quite some time now. There are a few steps that have been taking along the way. You know, we've already moved forward and passed. Um, regulations around short-term rentals here in Quincy, but we do then also need to update the actual zoning code in our zoning laws, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can make changes, but you really then need to update the actual paperwork that explains what those regulations are. And so that's what it, what it was last night. Um, we wanted to make sure that we actually updated the chart around the new zoning. And so if you actually go into the city zoning code and you look at this, right, it's, it, it separates everything out to, you know, your, your different sort of districts, right? Like residential A, residential B, so on and so forth. And then it, it you know, it sort of goes into further categories like single family homes, multifamily mm -hmm. homes, right? And what you can build in those areas and what applies in those areas. So now there's a new line item in there in that zoning chart that says short-term rentals. And it explains to you in that chart, if you're in residential A, B, C, commercial A, you know, so on and so forth, Okay. if you can do uh, short-term rentals or not. And so it's, it's making an update to that zoning chart. Okay, very good. And uh, how will those folks that are impacted be notified about that or, or will they? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, this has, again, been something that's been ongoing now for quite some time. So it's not like, you know, they didn't receive notice before and now all of a sudden they're getting notice on it, right? It, we had made these changes um, and have been discussing them for over a year now. Mm -hmm. um, this is simply a, a, a change that we just needed to make within our own city documents, right, to reflect okay. the decision that we made already a year ago. Okay, very good. Uh, and then uh, the full council convened for looks like one item. Yes, the most important QATP. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm looking for compliments or anything, Nina. <laughs> no, you, I mean, look, it's it's easy, right? It, we, I think um, I've said this probably so many times I can't even count. Um, we really got through these last two years, I think, because of QATP. Not just us, right? I mean, any government body, right? You know, that has public meetings and, and requires public engagement. You're talking school committee. You're talking the mayor's office. Um, planning board, zoning board, conservation, et cetera, right? We, we got through it because QATV was, you know, essentially making it possible for us to not only get information out there to the public, but for them to engage back with us as well. And so, you know, it's kind of like at this point, one can't exist without the other, right? We, we certainly are responsible for making sure that you all have what you need. Um, but in turn, that makes it possible for us to continue doing our jobs as well, right? And so whatever we can do to uplift and support QATV, which includes this request to Council Prime, which you submitted last night, essentially to say to the State House, because they do have some legislation pending that would impact QATV, that, hey, we support this, right? We want to see this happen. We can't vote on that, obviously, because we're not, you know, in the State House, um, but collectively as a body on the local level, we certainly can resoundingly say we support this. Um, and so hopefully 
it'll pass. Uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens and continue to follow it. But um, whatever we can do to encourage folks to, again, make your programming possible um, is something we're always going to get behind. So, well, on behalf of all of us here at QATV, thank the uh, thank you personally and the city council as a body for supporting us. We appreciate it very much. It means an awful lot to have our own um, government support uh, support our mission here for sure. It's a no brainer. <laughs> so, just for folks uh, to be aware, it's that the, the legislation in the state house basically would uh, require streaming services uh, to pay fees, just like broadcast services do, essentially uh, to fund local access cable centers like QA TV. So did you want to comment at all, Nina, on um, what's going on at the public schools uh, that's been in the news uh, over the past week or so? Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to say outside of, you know, we need to, we need to come together um, collectively as a city, right, as different bodies of government and, it's like I was saying at the beginning of our conversation, we need to listen, mm. you know, this isn't, this isn't new. Um, I can confidently say this probably wasn't the first incident, nor will it be the last, you know, and this isn't something that just because a lot of folks are talking about it now that it suddenly needs to be addressed. I mean, again, I, you know, growing up here in the city, there were things that I had seen as a kid when I was that age. Right. And it's incredibly disheartening and it's incredibly hurtful to see that all these years later, you know, that our students are still facing this. I mean, it's, it's my, I have nieces and nephews who are in high school. I have a lot of friends who's, you know, whose kids are in the schools. And, you know, if we don't, if we don't do something in response to this, I feel anyway, like what kind of message are we sending to these kids? Right. They're, they're standing up and, and not standing for this, you know? And so what are we doing in response to that? We need to do something. And, and I know that collectively as a community, there are quite a number of people who have right, stepped up in the past year, year and a half. Um, we have done that on the council, right? And in, in passing this request for social justice and equity department, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think at the end of the day, you know, just the, the, the different comments that I've seen on both sides of the issue, right? Um, I, I respect where everyone is coming from on it, but I do also believe that if we chalk this up to, oh, well, this person feels this way. And this person feels that way. And we're just gonna have to disagree and move forward. And that's it. That's not, I, I feel anyways, um, going to solve the problem. Right. And, and I think that that's why it's really important to have, again, this designated either department or person, right. Who focuses on social justice and equity to inform us uh, as to what we can and should do moving forward. Right. To address this, because just because I grew up here in the city, as you know, a minority woman, whatever it doesn't mean that I'm an expert on any of this, right? It doesn't mean that I have, you know, that one singular answer that's going to solve all these problems. And I don't think anyone does, right? Uh, but it is important to look and, and say, okay, well, when we now have this social justice and equity person or department um, who's educated in these kinds of matters, who is skilled in these kinds of matters and can give us the tools that we need, that I need, right, to properly address this and move forward in the best way possible. And right now, um, because there isn't that, right. I, I feel like there is this sort of vacuum and we're all trying to figure out the best way possible to respond. I mean, again, I think regardless of where folks stand on this issue, you know, collectively, again, as, as different bodies of government here in the city, we want the best for these kids. We want them to feel safe. We want them to feel comfortable enough in their environment, particularly at school, right. Where they can be best equipped to get the, you know, the most out of their education here. Um, and, you know, I come from a small business background. I don't come from a background focused on social justice issues, right? And so, you know, for me, I, I would love to have that person or that department to be able to go to and say, you know, in these kinds of spaces, in our roles and our responsibilities, what can we do, you know, to best address this moving forward? And so it's incredibly disheartening. Um, and, and I think the worst part about it is knowing that this is not the first or last time I'm sure, you know, these incidents are happening. Can the council kind of, um, city council kind of repropose that department again, Nina? Or how, how could that work? I mean, we, we certainly can, right? We as a body, we can propose anything, you know? sure. um, yeah. but you know, it's, it's something that we had, you know, proposed and voted on and passed already. So to propose it and vote and pass it again, it just, it, it seems more, um, more symbolic than anything else. And, and I think that, and again, I, I, 
I very rarely want to speak on behalf of my colleagues, but I think I can when I say that we don't want to do anything just to be symbolic, right? The nine of us, we have, we take this job and these responsibilities very seriously. If we're going to move forward on something like that, we want it to be more of the symbolic, right? And don't want to have a show just to have a show, right? Like we, we voted on it. We passed it. Um, you know, I think that's a statement from all of us on where, you know, where we wanted to see, you know, that department go. And so at this point, you know, there's, there's other things that I'm sure we can look into and, and try to do to be effective. But at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to be effective. Right. And, and we've already passed that department um, to reintroduce it. I don't know if I would frankly want to do that again, because we've already passed it. You know, we've already, we, we, I think made the statement that um, I certainly stand behind on that. Yeah. We're still awaiting the report from the uh, mayoral commission on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion that that hasn't happened yet. So um, there may be something coming out of that. That's correct. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see um, where that is and where that's going and what the result of that is going to be. What is uh, up next for the council for the rest of the session? Uh, so we have to set the tax rate that's going to be coming down the pike in December as well. And then whatever other items my colleagues and I um, want to introduce, you know, we don't have the agenda set yet. It's usually set, you know, that Thursday before uh, the meeting. So we'll mm-hmm. know that what's on the agenda moving forward, but I know definitely coming on the pike will be the uh, setting the tax rate for the next year. Sure. When is mm-hmm. the next meeting, um, Nina? It's going to be December. I had it in front of me. Um, December 6th, Monday, December 6th. Okay. We will catch up on the 7th if that's okay. Sounds good. All right. Good to talk to you. Thanks so much, Nina. You too, Joe. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.